they are innovative. They're a leader in our community. They are the largest non-government funder of health care for families in Surrey. The Surrey Hospitals Foundation's mission is to partner in our community, to partner with our community, with our business community, to support equitable and exceptional care in our Surrey hospitals. I'd like to acknowledge and welcome Harp Dillon, our, the board chair of the Surrey Hospitals Foundation. Let's give him a great round of applause. and all of the other board members of the Surrey Hospitals Foundation. Thank you for working uh, with the Surrey Board of Trade. I really appreciate your partnership. And it's my pleasure now to introduce your keynote speaker for this afternoon. He has been and is a strong advocate for public health care. He served as minister and minister for Francophone Affairs since July 2017. He serves as the current MLA for Vancouver Kingsway. Before becoming an MLA, he was the executive director for the Canadian Parents for French BC Yukon branch, a nonprofit organization promoting language education. He was a political commentator and journalist and the chief of staff to former BC Premier, Mr. Glenn Clark. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Adrian Dick. Well, it is great to be in Surrey. And uh, this is uh, the third occasion in the last uh, three years I've had a chance to speak to you, but the first in person. I think in person is better. And so it is great to see everybody here. It's great to see uh, my colleagues uh, from the legislature here. Gary Begg and Ginny Sims are here. Mike Starchuk's here. Eleanor Sturko's here, Trevor Halford's here. I want to say hi. We could almost have a legislative session, almost. We got a question period later, anyway. So that'll be good. And I want to thank uh, our partners at SFU who are, uh, because we're going to have a second medical school in British Columbia. It's going to be right here in Surrey as it should be, and I'm excited to have them here. It's great to see Harp and all the team at the Surrey Hospital Foundation. Thank them for all their work. I want to see members of uh, and representatives of healthcare workers and healthcare professionals in BC. I'm so honored to have people from the Hospital Employees Union and from the Health Sciences Association, the BC Nurses Union, the doctors of BC, and the ambulance paramedics of BC. I especially want to uh, shout out, and I'll be speaking about this later to Surrey firefighters for all that they've done, especially during the pandemic. Um, I, I know Surrey firefighters um, uh, have had a loss in the last couple of weeks, and our hearts are with them. And we are thinking of them, and we want to provide them with all of our support. It is uh, an honor, of course, to be here on the territory of the Coast Salish people. And since it's my first opportunity, in a way, to, to speak to a diverse audience in Surrey uh, since this period of pandemic, uh, I want to start by expressing a profound sense of gratitude to the community here. What the community in Surrey did, and we can start with healthcare workers. You know, um, people came uh, every day in a time of deep uncertainty in March of 2020. And they came and they cleaned our hospitals and provide nursing care in long-term care, did exceptional work, often, by the way, healthcare workers who had systematically been mistreated over time, members of the Hospital Employees Union and the BCNU and the Health Sciences Association and doctors and ambulance paramedics, everyone across the system. And to say that their work was exceptional to say that their actions were courageous, um, I think, is to greatly under, understate things. I am moved by the fact that people every day went into work in difficult conditions and still do to support other people. I think working in healthcare is the most important thing a person can do. It's a lifetime of work and devotion. 
but it was special during the COVID-19 pandemic, which has occurred concurrent with another public health emergency, the overdose public health emergency in BC. And what happened here in Surrey, in a community that was historically underserved by healthcare, the work of healthcare workers is something I think that we need to celebrate the work during COVID-19 and the work every day in our communities. And it was beyond that because really it was a team of people. Anita, you know the work that the Surrey Board of Trade and other business organizations, Chambers of Commerce, such as the one in Cloverdale and many other places did to bring people together. Media outlets in Surrey, which provided information that was critical to people in Surrey. It meant that we had in Surrey one of the most successful vaccination programs in Canada in big ways and in small ways. A A and w bringing food to healthcare workers at a crucial moment in the pandemic, A&W franchisees, that's something. And they were not alone. Mall owners so across the street here at the Guilford, uh, at, at the mall here, Guilford providing, uh, providing vaccination clinics all around the communities at Gudwaras and at malls and at Costco and at other places. We did this work together. It was an example of every business and a community coming together to doing in the most extraordinary times when we asked people to do things that we had never asked them to do before. People standing up for one another, standing up for the most vulnerable, standing up for seniors. And I am and will continue to be grateful for everyone involved in that effort at every level in our community. Because I think what it shows is that public health care in a time when we needed it when there was enormous uncertainty in our lives, delivered in a way that brought us together. And it's that spirit, but also delivered in a way that required immediate change in innovation. One day we had to delay non-urgent scheduled surgeries in BC, one day in March, and tens of thousands of surgeries were delayed. And that was a, a decision ultimately that I took based on the advice I received. But the work to do all of those surgeries and more to reduce the wait list in the pandemic, that was healthcare workers. That was surgeons and nurses and anesthesiologists and those that process the equipment and surgeries. They did that together and it was exceptional. We changed primary care in one day by adopting fee codes that allowed for virtual visits. It's a challenge in the system, it continues to be. The need for in-person visits. But we remember in March 2020, those fee codes didn't exist. We changed the system so that doctors could continue to provide care in the community. We went overnight from 95% of visits in person to 80% of visits through technology. In one day, that change was made. So this was an example. We talk about innovation. And no place, no place in BC was that more important than in Surrey. No place was it more important than Surrey. And so I wanted to start by just saying that this has happened in our lives. And it's easy to move past to the next thing. But it reflects, I think, what the people in this room and all the people out there believed. And you know, people sometimes talk in the COVID-19 pandemic about divisions. Well, 94% of people were vaccinated, almost 95, and 5% were, weren't. And that's a division, but it's not a division of 50-50. It's a division of 95-5. Healthcare workers were over 99% vaccinated. Well, that's a division, but that's 99 to under one. That's the division. In truth, what we saw is people coming together. And they did so, I would argue, as well in our, on our political teams. When we saw the challenge facing seniors who were being stuck at home, I asked a number of people to get involved and help organize a program that's continued called BC211, which has expanded out and expanded out through the United Way, our support to seniors in community. And I asked uh, Janet Rutledge, who's an NDP MLA, and I asked Ronna Ray Leonard, who's an NDP MLA, and I asked Shirley Bond, who's a Liberal MLA, and I asked Sonia Firstenau to put things aside and to work together to develop that program, and they did, and it made a difference. It tells us also COVID-19, what we have in common. And while there will always be debates about healthcare because it's so important and so central, I think we have to lean on what brings us together in the community. 
And finally, I just want to say this to, because um, the mayor of Surrey is here, that we have had more and consistent systematic support from the city of Surrey than one could possibly imagine in ways that are public and in ways that are not public. The city of Surrey during the pandemic worked with Fraser Health every day. Its mayor and councillors, the former mayor and the current mayor, and all of our councillors and all of the staff of the Surrey, city of Surrey. I see Linda here. She was one of the people who did that work. And I think that what it demonstrated is what we can do together. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit today. Because Surrey is a place that I love. This hotel I come to on a normal basis usually once a year. It's my wife Renee, Sarah Jeannie Saklikar is on the board of the Surrey Writers Festival. And my job is usually not to speak at that time, but to lift boxes and do important things like that. So I know this hotel really, really well. Surrey is the most dynamic place in BC. We gain in Surrey, you gain 100,000 residents a decade pretty much. And that's the past, but the future shows the same thing. We're going to see between now and 2038 more than 200,000 more people in this community. Can you imagine that? But the change, but it is also going to see in the next 20 years a different change than we've seen in the last 20 years. Surrey has been the youngest, the most dynamic community in BC. And you see that in its population. And that has affected the service sometimes it receives on healthcare issues in the past, I would argue. But in the next 20 years, you're going to see something dramatic and systematically change in that regard you're going to see the population of Surrey grow by the same amount as it has before, but the composition, the age distribution of that population, all the things we know about Surrey, the most diverse city, the largest indigenous population in Surrey, the fastest growing Surrey city, but also not anymore the youngest city. Surrey is going to return to the mean of, uh, of uh, communities in BC. Just to give you a sense, next 20 years, today, there are about 12,000 people over 80 in Surrey. In 2038, there are going to be 44,000, an increase of 230% in 20 years. The number of people between 1 and 17 is going to grow as well. It's going to grow by about 15%. But that's going to be a dynamic and different change. Over 60, the number of people in Surrey is going to double. While the rate of growth in the younger population is going to continue, it's going to be a changing time. And what that says for our healthcare system is we've got to build out to deal with that situation because all of us know that when we're in our 80s, we use healthcare services more than when we're in our teens. In our teens, it's different services. And that means we have to build out to respond to that and to respond to that in the community. So I want to talk a little bit about facts like that and talk about what we need to do uh, together to address that, talking about the future of healthcare in our community. I think um, one of the things I can say about Surrey, and it's a little bit more um, uh, of opinion, but it's reflected in the facts, that Surrey, we went through a period of decades in advance of my becoming leader of Minister of Health, where the overall spending on healthcare in BC and support for healthcare services in BC was significantly under what is, was healthcare inflation, the rate of population growth, and the need of healthcare in the community. And while that affected everyone in BC, it affected people in Surrey more because the population was growing in Surrey more. Right? So we see this in really practical ways. Uh, and the, some of the historic under support for the Fraser Health Authority is seen in those ways. Let me just give you two examples of what I mean. Uh, the first is on MRI service. Now, there are 800,000 more people in the Fraser Health Authority than are on the Vancouver Coastal Health Authority. When I became Minister of Health, they were doing more MRIs in Vancouver Coastal Health than in Fraser Health. Was it because there are fewer separated shoulders and hip replacements in Fraser Health? No. We had underbuilt, and people in Fraser Health disproportionately had to get private care to get access to vital diagnostic services. Well, we've changed that. It was 4,000 less when I became Minister of Health. 
Now they do, and this number is continuing to grow, 16, 16,000 more MRIs in Fraser Health. And we have got to continue to grow that out. Fraser Health was at the lowest level in the country for diagnostic care, and we've now made it back to the mean, and we've got to go higher for the very reasons I described at the beginning. In long-term care, which hasn't received an historically enough attention in this community and in Fraser Health, but look at the numbers, 230% more people over 80. Proportionally, that will mean that many more people in long-term care. Our long-term care homes in BC, when I became Minister of Health, are supposed to be funded to 3.36 Care, care hours per person. You're supposed to get 3.36 hours of direct care. In British Columbia, in Fraser Health, that was the, uh, the record was the opposite of that. 90% of care homes in BC were funded under that level. And the majority of them, including almost all the care homes in Surrey, were dramatically under that, such that residents in Surrey care homes got 40 minutes a day less direct care than the provincial government said they should have. And some of the care homes in Surrey, in uh, Peace Portal, which is in Trevor's riding, and uh, Hilton Villa, which is in Bruce Ry Ralston's riding, and Gil Guilford Seniors Village, which is in Gary Begg's riding, those three care homes were the lowest funded care hour care homes in British Columbia. And Surrey had, of the 75 care homes under 2.9, which is dramatically and unacceptably and dangerously low, Surrey had the most of those. So we had to change that, and we did. Every one gets funded more than 3.36 now. And the average in Surrey is 3.53. It was under three, and now it's 3.53. You say, well, what are those numbers? For a senior, 0 0.5 is half an hour of care each day, every day. And this becomes the obligation we have to have to one another. We saw this in the pandemic and why I focus on long-term care. I'm going to talk, of course, about the hospital in a second. But long-term care is essential. 70% plus of people in long-term care are living with Alzheimer's or other dementias. 70%. You need to provide long-term care. We were talking about this in Langley as well. You need to provide long-term care or your acute care hospitals inevitably become long-term care homes. And that means we have to invest in more and we have to raise the standard of care. And thank God we raised it above 3.36 before the pandemic happened. Now, during the pandemic, there was a lot of focus on long-term care because that was the group of people most vulnerable. And our workers in BC, members of, principally of the Hospital Employees Union and the BC Nurses Union, did the best job of any workers in Canada in supporting them. I'm so proud of them. But it was hard. It was hard going. And there was a lot of focus on long-term care at that time. Well, we've got to take that focus because the focus sometimes moves on to other things. We know that. We've got to keep that focus and we've got to drive that focus. It's why the, the um, long-term care homes being built by PICS in Cloverdale is going to make a difference for people in providing culturally appropriate care. But we've got to do more than that. We've got to assure the level of care is such that it meets our needs in the future. And it's important for hospital care. You talk to anyone at Surrey Memorial Hospital or Langley Memorial Hospital or Peach Arts Hospital, and the key issue that they're dealing with, it's in the news today, is the issue of patient flow, issues of hospitalists and emergency room doctors. But ultimately, if you don't have room on the wards, then you have people stuck in the emergency room. So you've got to improve long-term care so that people are not stuck in hospital when they should be in long-term care. And you've got to make do what we're doing with our hospitals and emergency room doctors right now and Fraser Health Hospitals, which is working with them in the same way as we've been working with the BCNU and the HEU and the HSA and the doctors at BC over time in resolving issues. In Surrey, hospitalists are on a contract that is too old and is out of date with the current circumstances. And we have a proposal on the table to change that. That's the kind of work we need to do together to improve things in those hospitals. But we also have to focus here on long-term care. It's vitally important, and home care, and supports in the community, so that that changing population in Surrey is met by the services they need. PICS is a good place to start, but it's not the only place. We have to keep building, and we have to go. And that's why 
We've spent between 2009 and 2017 as a province, in the whole province, $17 million on long-term care capital. Our current plan is to spend $2 billion and $39 million. And you know what? Needs to be more. Needs to be more. So that's something that we have to mobilize around and build around. It is easier sometimes, and we know this, and the foundation knows this, it's part of our shared frustration to raise money for things that are high profile. And long-term care is not as high profile as acute care, but it is needed and it is essential for acute care to support the workers in long-term care and to, and to ensure that we have the capacity in long-term care to give our seniors mostly, but others who need long-term care, the care that they need. I think we also have to do that in the community. And it's why I think it's been so important, the work that we're doing in, com in, in the community with, the, with new urgent and primary care centers, with a nurse practitioner-led care center in Cloverdale, with a new agreement with doctors, which has now been adopted by 3,055 doctors around BC, 500 of whom did not practice longitudinal family practice last year. How did we do that? We did that by investing and working with doctors on a solution, saying that fee-for-service might have made sense in the 80s and 90s and then the knots in 2010. It doesn't make sense anymore. So we changed it and we did it by working together. Equally, for people in healthcare, for the hospital employees union, we've worked to bring back workers who were working in hospital but were being paid poverty wages for doing it by bringing them back in and repatriating that job, working with the BC Nurses Union to, put, to lead Canada and, and lead North America in issues around ratios to ensure that nurses who are in the system are getting the supports they need, working with health sciences professionals with 336 new training spaces and doing the work that we do with them to improve safety in our hospitals, which is so required. These are the things we have to do together, but they don't get done because I decide from the stage or my office or anything else that they have to happen. They're done because we work with the HEU and we work with the community and we work with the HSA, we work with the BCNU and we work with the doctors of BC. And sometimes there's criticism and discussion. That's as it should be. This is a democracy. But we want to get this job done together and that's the work that we've been doing across the board. We also need a whole bunch of healthcare workers in the future, and this is critical for Surrey. I talked to you about the numbers. You're going to have uh, an increase of a population of 200,000 people in this city, but not just that, a dramatic increase, the largest increase among those who need healthcare the most are seniors. So we need to have a health human resources plan that makes sense. And that's precisely, again, what we're working to do. That's why, while it might have been the right decision not to proceed, with the Simon Fraser Medical School in the past, we're proceeding now. It's why we're adding 128 places at the UBC Medical School and the largest expansions they've ever seen and continuing the work they're doing. Why we're adding 602 training spaces um, to nursing in BC, 336 in it for health sciences professional and allied health workers, a HCAP program for healthcare assistance that has added with, with our infection control things, more than 7,000 workers and is one of the most successful health human resources program in history. We have to build out the healthcare system. We've added, since I've been Minister of Health, net 38,000 healthcare workers. But you know what? Got to do it again, next five years. And oh yeah, the five years after that, I don't think I'm going to be Minister of Health still. 38,000 more. And then the five years after that, 38,000 more. We have to therefore build a healthcare system that works and behave in a way that respects healthcare workers. And that's what we need to continue to do. Which brings me finally to the ho second hospital in Surrey. And I'm not gonna get into um, all of the details on it, but I'll tell you what we do, where we are right now. Next month, we're gonna announce the proponent, the person who's winning the bid. We're in a bidding process for that hospital. We're gonna announce who's going to build that hospital next month. And then in July, we're going to start work on that hospital, the early works for the hospital. And we're going to build that hospital together, and we need the su continued support of the community. We have had a level of support from Surrey City Hall, from Mayor Locke, from her predecessor, Mayor McCallum, from every councillor for that hospital that is unprecedented. 
It has been the most supportive municipality for that hospital, and I am grateful for it because it's meant that all of the things that sometimes stand in the way of construction in other communities have not stood in the way of construction of an essential public service. And I am grateful to them for their support. When we decided to build a second Surrey hospital, we asked Fraser Health and their outstanding president and CEO, Dr. Victoria Lee, to lead a process with the community, to lead a process uh, with professionals, medical professionals, but with the community and with experts in health planning and say, what do we need to do? And what we are building there is something, I think, exceptional. We are going to add, of course, and you've heard the numbers, and the numbers are important, 176 acute care beds in that community. But it's also 168, I should say, five operating rooms, four procedure rooms, 29,000 annual procedures, a 55 net new treatment spaces in the emergency room. That's 78,000 visits a year. We're going to be adding across that hospital a modern, dynamic, technologically advanced hospital that's going to contribute enormously to the community. And it's going to do two more things that I just want to focus on. I talked about firefighters earlier, and usually, as Minister of Health, I meet firefighters when they're advocating for cancer care, either for their members or for the community. We're adding a new cancer center uh, at the second Surrey Hospital meaning Surrey will have the highest level of cancer care of any community in BC, which makes sense because there's going to be more people with cancer in Surrey than any community in BC. People ask why this, it's the specialized care, why cancer is the specialized care you're adding to the hospital. Today, by far, the largest cause of death of Surrey residents and, and Langley residents and Delta residents and White Rock residents is cancer, by far. And so addressing those needs, and the number of diagnoses we're going to get in BC is going to go from 30,000 to 45,000. But here in Surrey, it's going to increase by some 140% over the next 15 years. We need a second cancer center in Surrey. So when you ask why we decided to fully integrate a cancer center as opposed to other services into the hospital that we're building, the second Surrey hospital we're building, that's why. It's because the experts in the area said that's what's needed in Surrey. And we are building out that care, as we are in, with new cancer centers in Burnaby and in Nanaimo and in Kamloops, to add to the cancer services that we provide now. For people in Surrey, it will make all of the difference to do that. But also, we have to acknowledge Surrey Memorial Hospital and the exceptional investment we've made there in the last few years and that we have to continue to make. It is an outstanding specialized hospital. We hear, you know, different things about it. I heard somewhere that they transfer patients out of uh, Surrey Memorial Hospital with higher QDT. We transfer way more patients in to Surrey Memorial Hospital. It is a leader in healthcare. But one of the challenges at Surrey Memorial Hospital is that it's the only hospital in Surrey. And while we have Langley and Peace Arch and, of course, Royal Columbian hospitals around us, it's the only hospital in Surrey. So it's a specialized hospital that also has to take everybody. And unlike other hospitals, such as Royal Columbian or St. Paul's, a disproportionate number of the cases they get in Surrey, the disproportional, are not specialized and not critical care. They take it all. Today at Surrey Memorial Hospital, there are 671 uh, people inpatient. That's our patient census today. 671. There's 625 base beds. There are 744 total beds at Surrey Memorial Hospital. It is busy, and it is busy with everything. So when you build a second hospital, you don't build a second specialized hospital. You build a hospital that is going to relieve some of that pressure so Surrey Ho Memorial Hospital can be the absolute hospital that it needs to be for, of course, cancer care itself, but also for renal care which is a high level of need in, our, in this community, and cardiac care and other services. That is the purpose of building a hospital. That is the purpose of health planning. It's going to be the largest capital project, provincial contribution to a health capital project in the history of British Columbia, the new Surrey Hospital. And it's going to make a difference. And we need all the people in this room and all the other people in this room to get behind that project because it will be remarkable. We are building a lot of capital projects in BC, 17 major projects across the province. But one, only one is net new. The other 16 are replacement projects. One community, one, is getting a new hospital because one community, one, 
frankly, has been underfunded for health care for a generation. And that has changed in the last six years, and it's got to continue to change. Not because we're competing one community against another, but because there are a lot more people here, and this is a dynamic place. It's going to become BC's leading city soon, and we've got to deliver the care necessary to that. So that means primary care. That means support care in the community. That means a significant emphasis on mental health and addictions care. And all of the work we're doing at the Mental Health and Addictions Urgent Care Center, all the work we have to build out to do in the community. That means care for, especially for seniors in long-term care and home care and home support. And it means acute care. People ask me, what's the priority? We have to do it all. And that's why it's been such a focus. There's no community in BC that's receiving more investment than Surrey. And that's because there are profound and historic needs here. We only have one hospital. Don't think we need a discussion of why we only have one hospital. We only have one hospital in Surrey. And that's going to change. We don't have enough long-term care. That's going to change. We're building out our primary care networks. That's changing. We've made Surrey a leader in diagnostic care. That's changing. We've added and set records for surgeries at Surrey Memorial Hospital. That's changing. And we've got to continue to do this. And what we need from all of you, and I'm looking forward to hearing your question, is to continue both to hold us to a high standard. That's to be expected. For healthcare workers to say, this has got to be better and this has got to be better now, that's what should happen. But also to come together as we have in the last few years to make healthcare better in our community and to be there for people who need us, whether it's the young child diagnosed with type 1 diabetes or the senior who needs long-term care, the person who needs cardiac care, the person who needs support for cancer care. We've got to be there for them. And our dynamic approach, I think, of investment and support, of look at building on human capital and on physical capital needed is the one we need going forward. So I thank you for having me today. I look forward to taking your questions. I'm here, you're there. Maybe Everyone, uh, now is the time for a question period. If you do have a question, uh, please go to the microphone, uh, state your name, your company name, and your question very briefly. Uh, that would be great. But I'm just going to start with the first question, if I may, Gerard. You know, never before uh, during the pandemic has healthcare, business, government worked so well together. And we had these weekly meetings with the minister, with the premier, Premier Horgan back then. And uh, every single day, there was about eight of us that met with you every single week. Moving forward and lessons learned, and in our work with uh, the CEO of Fraser Health, if we had another pandemic, would you do anything different than what you did? Um, uh, lots of things. And uh, I, I think the spirit of it was exceptional in BC. Um, what wouldn't I change? I'll start with there. Um, we supported our health professionals, and we supported our provincial health officer, who made some of the toughest decisions that have ever been made. And you saw other jurisdictions. I'm not going to comment on them, but that didn't happen everywhere. It didn't happen in every jurisdiction. It happened here. And we reached out and worked with all the parties in the legislature. We worked closely with our health care workers and our health care unions who were exceptional supporters of our combined effort and really stepped up for patients. We had to work comprehensively with businesses in, the, in every community and individual businesses as well. And, and one of the things about Surrey that I think you have to remember is not just the fastest growing community, but in its composition, the largest number of essential workers. People had to go to work, not just in healthcare, uh, firefighters, but think of it, our grocery workers, food distribution, all of those essential services. And the things that we did with individual businesses and with business organizations were exceptional. So I think those are all lessons that that approach worked. We also have to prepare better, you know. Um, I think we did really important things in getting uh, PPE in our province. But we as a country have to decide, I think, what happened in the pandemic 
was um, unusual. We frequently think of unstable countries as being countries somewhere else. But we had contracts in BC for PPE with our American providers that um, they broke one day to the next at a time when the demand for PPE rose. So a lot of what we were doing in, uh, in the beginning of April of 2020 was going out and finding PPE for healthcare workers. And it was hard on the ground. It was hard on the ground. Because there was the unknown, the need for the highest possible level. And whether it was Dr. Lee in Fraser Health, who is, I mean, um, I get to see it from a different angle than everyone else, is just an exceptional leader. Or our chair, Jim Sinclair in Fraser Health, who led a lot of our work with workers and business and ensuring that businesses were safe across the province and in Fraser Health. I think we did exceptional things. So those are the right lessons. But there are some specific things we have to do to prepare, including making sure we have stockpiles of essential things that are in place so we're not in the middle of a pandemic with all of that uncertainty, working day unto day to get PPE for two weeks from now. We need to address those issues and be prepared for that. And finally, I'd say it's not just pandemics, right? We're living in a time of, um, of climate change, and we're going to see more pressure. And during the pandemic, people will know this, we received, um, uh, we went through uh, the heat dome. It dramatically affected people in every part of uh, BC, particularly um, in the downtown east side and in the corridor down Kingsway. And so that preparation, well, we can talk about it in terms of pandemic, and there's some specific lessons to be learned there that we have to learn. We also have to prepare for climate emergency, for fire, for flood, all of these things that BC has faced together. So we've got to be prepared for all of those things, and that involves, it can't just involve the government. And what was, I think, uniquely successful about the pandemic was the work we did with nonprofit organizations, with unions, and with business that allowed us to reach the broader community when we absolutely had to. Minister, uh, thank you and welcome to Surrey. My name is Gerard Bramo. I am the CEO of the Centre for Child Development of the Lower Mainland and we serve over 4,000 children with developmental disabilities yeah. throughout the South Fraser region every year. Uh, I will not be too brief, Anita, because I am also on the overall steering committee for the Primary Care Network um, for Surrey and North Delta. Yeah. I am also on the SFU Community Advisory Council. Uh, and uh, also in the Healthy Community Partnership. And that's not to brag about me, it's to say thank you for <laughs> understanding the depth of the challenges in Surrey and the need for all of us to step up and partner together. Sorry, Minister. Th thank you for all of that. You got a longer title than I do. Well, I was aiming for that. That was my purpose. Uh, no, my purpose was the same as yours, and thank you. It's in relation to the reality of uh, what, thank you for acknowledging, is the historic uh, underinvestment in Surrey's health care uh, at a per capita level. And as we look forward, um, and I look at the children across the South Fraser, uh, we have a very complicated healthcare system, as you know. And thank you to Jim Sinclair for obviously uh, already encouraging you very thoroughly with what's needed on the acute care side. And I appreciate that. And thank you, Jim. Um, on the chronic care side for children, those 4,000 children we serve every year, there are 30,000 children, 0 to 19, with a disability of any type across the South Fraser, and we have been fighting long and hard to try and increase that investment, and it is complicated, and we're grateful to uh, the BC government, the increased investment from the Ministry of Children and Family Development, and we look forward to partnering with you on the solutions side between the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Children and Family Development, because we have caseloads that are twice that of the surrounding areas where um, it's overwhelming. Uh, you acknowledge the significant growth in children and youth in our region, and as you think forward about reaching similar levels for community chronic health care and that developmental uh, milestones that children are going through, we're a pediatric outpatient medical rehabilitation center celebrating our 70th year. It has been a fight from parents, from families for all those 70 years to be able to address this arc that keeps exceeding our ability. So I look forward to your response, Minister. Thank you for your transparency about the challenges we face, and thank you for all the support to build Surrey's health care system. Yeah, th thank you, and it's um, at every level. I want to acknowledge I didn't speak about it when I was talking about the pandemic, 
but the whole sector of both people supporting both adults and children with developmental disability, um, that sector did some of the most exceptional work you could imagine during the pandemic. And I know uh, uh, Dr. Henry uh, worked on a weekly basis, Dr. Gustafson, other leaders work very closely. I think one of the things that BC can be proudest of is its response to um, the impact of COVID-19 on children. And it, it manifests itself in different ways. It's more important for many children uh, with disabilities that school be open and the school be open and safe. And BC, and this, you know, we, we tend to talk about these things in political terms. This was teachers and parents and people uh, at child development centers and, and uh, administrators. And no jurisdiction in Canada had schools open as we did, as soon as we did. Because we knew what you know, which is that six months lost or with less schooling for a child in the community can be a lifetime of loss for that child. It's hard to catch up. And that's equally true in our support for people with child development. We gotta do a better job in BC in terms of diagnosis and response. This is something we talk about in the legislature a lot for children with uh, disabilities and for adults. There's been some amazing things that have happened in some categories of developmental disabilities. Life expectancy in, in this century has increased by decades. But that presents with us new problems and new challenges. First uh, meetings I had with someone after I became an MLA was from Surrey. Guy uh, had taken care of their child, their son, for 45 years. Can you imagine that? Living with a developmental disability, and his wife passed away. And they've been an old, you know, they called themselves an old fashioned husband. He went to work, he made money, and his wife cooked the meals in that case and uh, took care of their son during the day. And that's the relationship they had. And his wife passed away, and he never cooked a meal. And he needed help. And the system wasn't good at providing that. And we've got to put eyes on these questions. Because one of the challenges in healthcare, <laughs> one was asking me earlier about people speaking out in healthcare, is that we can speak out generally, but not specifically. That the privacy afforded children who need care sometimes stops their issues from being raised. It's why in some of the most famous uh, issues in child, um, the Ministry of Children and Families, some of the most infamous issues have been raised after a child passes away because in some ways at that point um, there's a discussion, there's formal processes and there's coroner's inquests and other such things that address those issues. But generally speaking, uh, what we need to be, I think collectively, is have a better, bigger voice and my concern about this period of the pandemic in healthcare is that a lot of the issues that we really focused on during the pandemic, such as the people, uh, children with disabilities, such as adults with disabilities, such as uh, people in long-term care, they get washed away in the discussion of other issues. And I think those were central questions in the pandemic and the momentum and the changes we made, we've got to build on now. And that's a critical part of what we do. So thank you for all the work you do. And it's particularly important here because even though I talked about what 20 years from now, right now, Surrey continues to be the youngest community in BC. And we've got to make sure our children have the supports they need. And when we do that, the benefits can carry on for generations. Mr. Dix, my name is CJ Sidhu. I'm Sanja TV host, also a financial advisor. So a couple of questions. It's a very complicated uh, field that you are in charge of. We understand and appreciate that. Um, you know, our services going out of province. Our physicians in emergency are burned out and uh, they send a letter to media. And it's such a complex uh, situation. And on top of that, the capital spending on these projects and we are just talking about Surrey. How you balance this? Where the funding will come? Um, uh, let me just talk about it in a general sense first, and then I'll be specific about a couple of the issues that you raised. Uh, I think healthcare is worth it. I think healthcare is worth it. 
This is the most important increase in public health care in this year's budget that we've seen in BC in a very, very long time. And the investments that we're making to improve primary care, to advance nursing, to support health sciences professionals, support health care workers, these are fundamental changes. And this isn't, and the problem in the past has been, there has been a desire. I can name you, because I was the health critic for the NDP before that, times when people had one and two year solutions, and it was endemic at the federal level and at the provincial level. Oh, there's a problem. Oh, there's a media issue. We'll deal with it for a while. We'll do 10,000 urgent MRIs. We'll do X number of surgeries. Then it would go back. And what we need to do in our province is build out our capacity. That means over time more acute care beds, of course, but also more surgeries need capacity. Because the only thing that happens if you don't do the surgeries, and we had another record year for surgeries, is that people go on wait lists. These are medically necessary surgeries, you need to do them now. So I think public health care provides excellent value for people. And I think it provides, in particular, excellent value for businesses. We have businesses in Washington State and Oregon, other communities that are direct competitors of ours. And they have a different health care system down there that is dramatically more expensive. It's a business cost that is significant. Our health care system, our public health care system, is more efficient. It allocates care, I think, well based on need and not on how much money you have. And that's more efficient. It's the right thing to do, but it's also the efficient thing to do. And so we have to continue to understand and value that, value the role that health care plays in the economy, in community, but also value what it means when it's your child, your brother, your mom who needs health care and needs it right away. So that means acting. And we have to act in the present, in the here and now. And we've got to act, I, I think, and we've got to act uh, into the future. In cancer, talk about cancer care. Here's what we're doing. We have a 10-year uh, cancer plan in BC. We're going to go from 30,000 diagnoses to 45,000 diagnoses. We have a major health human resources plan. We just increased the wages of oncologists in BC so that we can recruit more effectively by more than $60,000. We raise radiation therapist salaries. They're members uh, generally of the Health Science Association significantly as well. And we did that because we need to build up the human resource capacity to meet that test and to provide care now. And you know, there's a little controversy right now, a discussion about something I announced on Monday, which is in one area of healthcare, in general, we lead provincial jurisdictions, especially Alberta, in key measures in healthcare, surgery and other measures. We added last year 6.7% more nurses. They lost nurses in Alberta. We added family doctors. They lost family doctors in Alberta, right? So we're performing well. But when I see an area such as radiation therapy where we weren't meeting our meet time, wait time requirements and we needed to do maintenance on some of our equipment, well, you've got to act. And, it, and you've got to act because you've got to see the patient and too often we don't see the patient. There's a big debate, public, private, what's this, what's that, who's spending what, liberals, NDP, BC United, right? There's too much of that and not enough seeing the patient in the here and now and saying that wait time's too long. And we, we can do something about it. And there's a moral, economic, and healthcare imperative to do so. And so that's why you take steps like the step we took on Monday, which is to reduce wait times for people who need radiation therapy and to make sure that 95 percent uh, uh, of them receive their therapy within 28 days. I'm proud of those kind of actions because it shows a public health care system that hasn't forgotten to see the individuals who are getting care in that system. And that's what we've got to continue to do. So you're seeing uh, longer questions or uh, shorter questions, longer answers, right? Is that the? Shorter answers. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Courtney. Hi, my name is Dr. Courtney Young. I'm the head of cardiology at Surrey Memorial. Hi. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I had a question. Well, actually, first off, I want to say I'm right alongside you when you say you're all about essentially giving the best quality care to the patients of Surrey or the people of Surrey, yeah. and even more so improving the quality of care that we can provide. Along that lines, I'm wondering what is yours and the ministry's specific plan for cardiac services for patients in Surrey? First of all, you do exceptional work at Surrey Memorial Hospital and in cardiac care. 
And we see that in the results for patients, right? The commitment of people who work in ca cardiac care at Surgeon Memorial Hospital is uh, beyond dispute at the highest possible level. The vast majority of people, of course, present for care, get care at the hospital. And so we have to continue in that area, as in others, to meet the growing needs of the community. There's something that has become part of the public debate about it, is uh, that you would be able to spend, it's sort of absurd that I'm talking about it and not you, because it's uh, cardiac catheterization, right? And there's a lab, there's five of them, one in each health authority in the province. Right? And um, actually, this was a decision in part by the previous government, but one that we've continued and put in place to significantly invest in the lab at Royal Columbian Hospital. And there's one per health authority. And the question in that case is the same as the cancer question. Do we see the demand? And where should we put, say, a sixth lab if we were to do that? And that's something that we would have under active consideration, for example, for that. But it's also, and this is the point I was making about the second hospital, one of the challenges at Surrey Memorial Hospital is Surrey Memorial Hospital does everything. Right? It's the second biggest hospital in the province after Vancouver General Hospital, and it's doing everything. And you have to relieve some of that community demand, not create a second specialized hospital in, in, at Cloverdale, except for cancer. You've got to relieve some of that demand so we can invest in cardiac care. But it's not just cardiac care, say this. It's renal care, which has a real, it has a demand spike that's more, you know, very significant as well. It's providing mental health and addiction care. As I talked about cancer being the leading cause of death, and it's true, but in lives lost, the second leading cause of death in the Fraser Health Authority is overdose. So we have to address those questions too. But cardiac is part of it, and it'll be a central part of the discussions uh, at, at Surrey Memorial Hospital. And it, what's required to do that, and would it have been done 15 years ago? It wasn't. Is, is the building of the second hospital as well, and then taking the steps we need to take in all of these areas. The Surrey Memorial Hospital is key for renal, key for cardiac, key for trauma, key for cancer, key for everybody. And we've got to invest in Surrey to do that. On renal, for example, that may be investing outside the hospital because of the nature of renal care, which you'll understand better than my, cardi on cardiac care, which is advanced there. We've, it, it almost certainly has to be done at the hospital. And that means both relieving pressure in the hospital, that's what we're doing, and investing in that care. So that's where we're going at cardiacs, is a significant and important issue, and it's going to continue to be. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. Hello, Minister Dix. <clears throat> My name's Amarjeet Mann, and I'm a healthcare worker here in the city of Surrey. Hi. So first, I'd like to thank you for coming today and applaud you on your initiative for adding a second hospital in Surrey. As you rightly stated, Surrey is, echoing your words, BC's leading city, the fastest growing city in the province. And you mentioned that you want to have Surrey become the, Surrey Memorial Hospital become the full specialized hospital. Yeah. Unfortunately, I, I, I do feel what you are proposing right now falls short, well below the mark of what is required for our community for effective access for our patients. And I'm gonna give you two anecdotal stories which absolutely illustrates this. I had a family member of mine who had a brain hemorrhage, walking on a treadmill at the gym, passed out, was, put in, uh, was transferred to the emergency room at Surrey, had the MRI done, had a full uh, hemorrhage, full out bleed, MRI was done, they consulted Royal Columbia, no bed at Royal Columbia, the neurosurgeon said, put him on cruise control in the emergency department and we'll see if we can get a bed for him in the morning. The family member we told, we will spend any amount of money, transfer us to a hospital in the US or somewhere else. We actually had to advocate to a physician who spoke to the emergency doctor there, can you speak to somebody at VGH and transfer over. Fortunately, the emergency doctor advocated on behalf of the patient had him transfer to VGH, was seen by a resident that evening and scheduled for neurosurgery the next morning. In a situation and a full-blown brain, the typical outcome in that patient is 10% survival. Had she remained in Surrey Hospital and waited for transfer the next day, she would have died. Another patient, cardiac, myocardial infarct, sent to Surrey Hospital, 
waiting for a bed to get transferred to Royal Columbia the next morning, died at Surrey Hospital. So these cardiovascular events are, are very common. I don't know what the statistics are, but you mentioned that Surrey Moore needs to become a, a specialized hospital. In my mind, and as a healthcare professional, specialized hospital means you need full multidisciplinary service at that hospital. You need interventional cardiology, you need neurosurgery, and you need renal. The community hospital you're proposing, yes, it's gonna help with the oncology, but we need to have a real discussion about when Surrey will get the full multidisciplinary hospital that this community deserves and needs so the patients in this community get access to the health care that they deserve. Well, right? I, and I that's think, what um, it comes down to. So, so we've had government after government, the Liberal government, it's all about the narrative, we're going to get you a hospital, get you in a hospital. But quite frankly, Minister Dix, it's not just a hospital we need, we need a full multidisciplinary hospital. I like the fact that Simon Fraser has become a medical school. This medical school needs to become a, a cyber site uh, teaching hospital at Surrey Hospital. So you have the residents there and we need to have this done now. The election is coming. I think we as a community, and I empower everybody here, start speaking to your local representatives. Who is going to work to give the health care that our families in this city need and deserve? When you look so, north of the Fraser River, there is no doubt in my mind when I speak to a family member, if you are able to, please go to VGH. I had a recent situation with a mother. She had a neurological issue. She was put on a, she had seizures, all kinds of things going on. I was going to wait for neurology consult here. We went to VGH and the care there was remarkable, absolutely outstanding. And the, the, the fact of the matter is much of our community Just does not know. Just going to ask you to wrap up, please. Sorry, go ahead. So I'll, I'll put it to Minister okay. Dix. Okay. And so when are we going to get the multidisciplinary specialized hospital that you talk so, about? So you talked about um, politics. Yeah. So let's talk about politics. Yeah. Um, we'd have a Surrey Medical School today, yeah. but they stood in the way of that. Now we're having one. Yeah. Promise one, promise made, promise being kept. We said we needed a second hospital in Surrey. Everyone agrees, but you agree with that. We need a second hospital in Surrey. Promise made, right? Promise kept. We need in primary care a significant upgrade in primary care. I think we all agree with that because that's one of the ways you address the needs of people in the community. And we, are, we have new UPCCs, a new contract with doctors, a primary care plan that makes sense. We need people. It's not just an issue of buildings and equipment. We need people. And so we have a health human resources plan with 70 actions because we need the doctors of the future and the nurses of the future. When we did surgical renewal in this community, which dramatically added to the capacity of healthcare in this community, we did it by training more anesthesiologists, more trained surgical nurses, 900 during a pandemic, 80 more medical processing technologists in the system. When we can, we want to do these things, we can do them. You know, you talk about the healthcare system. So we do have a healthcare system that has a number of hospitals and people get transferred. More people get transferred to Surrey than get transferred away, but some get transferred away, as you've suggested, right? And all of our healthcare systems, and we see transferring between hospitals throughout our system. We're building a system not on municipal boundaries, of course, but on healthcare boundaries, and that's what we're doing. So it's a good news for people in Fraser Health that we're upgrading the catheterization lab at, at Royal Columbian Hospital. Um, there's a, will be a discussion, debate about how you expand out on those things. But, um, you know, this is an unprecedented investment. And, it's, and some of it is required to allow other things to occur as well. But it's gotta be all of the elements of healthcare. At Surrey Memorial needs more long-term care beds in Surrey. Surrey Memorial needs better primary care in Surrey. Surrey Memorial needs better home care in Surrey. Surrey Memorial needs a second Surrey hospital. Surrey Memorial needs an SFU medical school. And Surrey Memorial needs the addition of other services. Surrey Memorial is a great special, specialty hospital, but part of its limitations are the very things I've described. It has to do everything. It is the one hospital in the community. It has to do everything. And you can allow more things to happen. You create that when you do that. And that's why the planning for this hospital wasn't another specialty hospital, except for cancer, right? But was to uh, support Surrey Memorial Hospital and all it's doing. Uh, look, you know, 
Sorry, you know, the foundation put out a thing that listed off hospitals in Fraser Health. It's a whole region, right? People in Langley, people in Delta, people in White Rock, they're not going to get, they're not, they don't have a Surrey Memorial Hospital now, but they depend on Surrey Memorial Hospital to a great extent, right? $1.5 billion project in Burnaby, massive project of Royal Columbian Hospital. That was the choice the previous government were delivering on in that case. New emergency room at Eagle Ridge, new emergency room at Abbotsford, rebuilding the one they built 10 years earlier when they underbuilt a hospital in Abbotsford, right? New emergency room and ICU at Langley Memorial Hospital, new at Peace Arch Hospital, right? All of those things. And so all of that builds out the capacity in Fraser Health that had been underbuilt over time. Every one of the hospitals on that list is having a major project at it. It's capital and it's health human resources. And to do what you want to do requires both. It requires the training of appropriate health human resources. That's what we're doing. And that's what the plan says. And it's building out the capital. There has never been a capital plan in the history of BC. Never been a health human resources plan like this one. And we need to support it. We need to make it work. And we need to make it better. Thank you. Thank We're you. gonna move on to the next question. And if you can all keep your questions very brief, and the answer is very brief to get through the whole lineup sure. there. Sure. Thank you. My name is Rebecca Smith. I'm the executive director of the Surrey Hospice Society. I'm also president of the Chamber of Commerce sur serving East Surrey, Clayton, Cloverdale, and Campbell Heights. What we have learned from the pandemic is that healthcare is not just about our bodies. It's about our minds, our teeth. It's about everything. And the three last years of social separation, heightened anxiety, depression, loss, grief, has been exponential in terms of the mental health fallout. Everyone is suffering. Nobody is, is scatheless from this situation. Now, what we know too is that you cannot silo healthcare. When we look at the statistics, the studies done, mental health care reduces the overall health care costs of physical health care. So what my question is to you is how are you going to address the systemic siloing of health care? You have a separate ministry dealing with mental health and addictions, a separate health ministry dealing with seniors and with children. All of this is all one. We are society and we need to face it. Um, I will bring in Surrey Hospice to it. You've mentioned the leading cause of death in Surrey being cancer as well as cardiac incidents. I deal with all causes of death in Surrey with the Surrey Hospice Society. We help people who are facing the end of their life. Um, but we also, 80% of what we do is bereavement and grief support. The demand for our services have gone up over 38% every year in the last three years and 22% every year preceding that. Our funding is down over 50%. We can no longer sustain a system offering what the government of British Columbia does not offer, which is free mental health care. So two questions in one. How are you going to address the siloing? And how are you going to help us help the people that need it? Because everyone in this room, whether you know it or not, is a client of Surrey Hospice Society. Because nobody gets out alone, gets out alive, and nobody leaves or lives alone. You affect people around you every day. And when you go, there will be people grieving and suffering and needing help. And that's what we do for free on a charity budget. So, so I was, uh, so uh, this answer, because I've been asked to be a little shorter, and you asked a question that probably deserves a 20-minute answer, say. Uh, just, we'll just keep that in mind. First of all, obviously, um, the impact of the pandemic We'll talk about it in terms of lives lost or people infected or vaccination or whatever you see the period of the pandemic. But I don't think um, any of us fully understand its full impact yet. It affected people differently, you know. Um, as some people know, in our family, uh, my mother-in-law died in long-term care. That was the last two and a half years of her life. She was in the Fraser Health facility with five other people in her room. Last two and a half years of her life. Right? And, you know, um, the sense of grief and guilt that people feel just for that 
we otherwise, and she was a wonderful person, and she lived a wonderful life, and I'm very proud of her. It's not any of that. But still, but still, there were high school basketball players who didn't get to play their championship game. Well, I remember the championship game I was involved in. We won. And uh, in Vancouver, in that case, made a big difference. I remember it to this day. I remember how many points everybody scored, and people were denied that access. And, it, and if it was an important thing in your life, and you were a, a girl or a boy who played high school basketball, that was pretty significant. There's all of the funerals we didn't get to attend, all of the grief felt, all of that was profound. The nature of isolation, everything we do in seniors care, and often with people with developmental disabilities, is to get people into the community. And we had a pandemic that was separating people. And we have to return to that. Does everybody feel, does everybody in this room feel normal coming together in this way today? You need to adjust, right? And we're all at adapting and adjusting. So the level of both what, what I'd call, we, we, there's a lot of focus appropriately on overdose deaths, and this is a massive public health emergency that we need to deal with in profound ways, and we are together as a community, and um, all of us are learning to do that. But there's a broader mental health question more broadly in society. And I think the way that you address that, it, we were, one of the ways we're trying to do that is to build out what are called primary care networks, because that's people providing care in the community. The largest group of people hired in primary care networks in BC are mental health and addiction professionals. These are networks that are funded by the provincial government. There are about 1,500 people supporting existing primary care clinics in the province. And we have to, in the community, be able to provide more supports, not just for the most severe cases, the 99th and the 98th percentile, which are by definition um, of significant importance all the time in the system, but also people who have, are in the 90th percentile of need, which means they have serious mental health issues and to provide better care for them. On your specific issue, I'll talk to you about that because that sounds like a, a more detailed thing, but I think that you're absolutely right that we're at a point where historically in Canada, we, ha we haven't had a mental, a mental health care system in place in the way that we have for physical health. We're having to do that now in a time of great challenge to the system, but we have to continue to do that work together. And it's not just people suffering the most extreme crises, although those are very important, but there's a broader group in the population in, in amongst our friends and our families that are being affected now, and we've got to try and find ways to help them that are both efficient, because a lot of people need that support, but also effective. I'm Minister Dick, Scott Wheatley, Executive Director of the Cloverdale District Chamber of Commerce. I don't really have a question, just a comment. My comment is, it's not only a person's physical health, but the health of the community. And I just want to say the excitement in our community about this new hospital is amazing, it's palpable. Uh, all the ancillary development, all the new jobs, all the access to health care, all of those are huge, and you and your department should be committed, and we look forward to helping you get that hospital going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it's, uh, look, uh, it's an important site, and you know, it's also in terms of representing all of Surrey, uh, it's the right location for the hospital. And to be able to have that at the Kwantlen campus as well is going to help us with health human resources. But it's the right location. You can see the growth in your community, and this is the right location for the hospital, the second hospital in Surrey. So thank you, and thank you for all your work and support. Hi, I'm Sally Barrio. I'm the local department head of emergency at Surrey Memorial. Hi, <laughs> I, the problem child, yeah. Um, um, uh, so um, it's, it's quite, my question... It's quite the, quite the opposite, I think. <laughs> it wasn't me, I, I promise. I, I, I think, okay, <laughs> let, let's, let's do it this way. You announce who you are, and everyone please break into applause. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting the evil eye from Dr. Bell, but anyhow... Um, um, but my question really is your vision, or the ministry's vision for the Surrey campus, like the existing Surrey campus, because you're right, we do everything. Thank you for the gentleman who shared his family, uh, because that's us, right? Yeah. Um, it's us to look for patient in the eye. We can't do, we can't look after them in the right place. <coughs> um, two days ago, I admitted three patients with advanced cancer. Right. They were told in a hallway, and they lay there languishing in the hallway, a hallway coping with their new diagnosis. There's no dignity to that. 
Um, I left today, there's 80 patients in our department, majority are in hallways, all of them are old. Uh, so I just think that we do do everything, but we don't have a trauma service. We, we need a, a, you know, a cardiac service. We, need, we saw tw 250 children in a 12-bed unit in our pediatric department, and we look after 46% of the province's kids. So s new hospital or not, our site needs a new tower, or we need some sort of support on our, in our campus because we are going to be the specialty service for everybody in this, you know, you're talking about the numbers yourself. You, everyone's getting old, they're gonna get more complicated. We're gonna have way more people. We have a lot of complex patients that we see with multiple language barriers, healthcare issues from other countries. You know what, you know what the demographics are in Surrey. So it's a very hard place to work. And even with a new hospital, I just don't feel we're gonna still be in the same situation in, in five years, 10 years from now, unless we really put some like, um, money into our campus to provide the best care we can. Yeah, yeah I, th I think, um, <laughs> could, I, could I say just at the beginning that I, li I like it that the hospital that's gonna cost billions of dollars um, is seen as a given and now we move on to the next thing, right? It's not. We have to build it together and make it work and make it succeed and for certainly people needing cancer care. Uh, in, uh, in Surrey, they'll make a world of difference. And that's the, that's, we talk about all the forms of care, that's the form of care that will be most missing in Surrey unless we take this action. And people always talk, there's a sense, certain sense of want always here, I think, and everywhere else. But because uh, healthcare was so significantly underbuilt, particularly in the last uh, 20 years in Surrey, uh, leading into my time as Minister of Health, I think we focus on that. Building the new Surrey Hospital is really important. It's a massive investment. It will have, what, 29,000 surgeries, 200,000 cancer treatments. It's pretty significant. So, you know, I, I think I appreciate that people say, well, that's not the only issue. No one said it was. No one says it was. And all of those other issues are important. In terms of capital contributions, as I said, we really need, and Sir Morrill and the new Surrey Hospital and all our other hospitals, are gonna need some build out of long-term care. Because the issue you have when people are stuck in the emergency room is no room on the wards and you can't afford, as we see an increasing population of seniors, to have people who should be getting care in long-term care. It's the appropriate care, it's the possible care to have that. And so you see that, some people see that as a hospital problem, it's actually a long-term care problem. We need to do that as well. So these are all uh, priorities, right? Well, one of the things I would say though, just in a general sense, is that we also have to have a healthcare system that works for people. It helped people in Surrey that we built the Langley Project, got it done. Helped people in Surrey that we built the Peach Arch problem at hospital, and it helps people that we're doing, for example, the upgrade of the, of the catheterization lab at Royal Columbian Hospital. That's good for people. That's not bad for people. That was necessary, planned, and important work. And we just got, we have to continue to make that investment. So no one's, I think, uh, suggesting that Surrey Memorial is one of those priorities, quite the contrary. Yeah. How, what that looks like is something that we have to build out together, but the second hospital is an absolute necessity. Absolute necessity. The reason we're building is it's absolutely necessary for the people of Surrey, but also for everyone who works at Surrey Memorial Hospital. So I make the case for that and say, we can't just elide these things. Oh, we'll build the new hospital and then. We've got to do all these things, right? We gotta do all those things. And finally, I'd say people are, are dealing with these issues in the present, right? So I'm very conscious of the health human resources steps we need to take now. Because the issue in some cases is building, and in lots of cases it's making sure we're staffed. And so then there's significant issues, and I'm not gonna talk about it because we're in negotiations on these questions. We have been, for example, with hospitalists but we made a change in the way we paid family doctors, which has been an extraordinary, overwhelming success to date. It's remarkable. Last year, if we'd had this meeting, I'd been asked a lot of questions about family doctors, right? And we still got a long way to go, and we gotta do it, and we gotta do all the work, and we gotta recruit more and everything else, but there would have been three or four questions right at the beginning about family doctors. Well, we took significant and historical action to get together. And, that's how, uh, and that came out of, I think, an approach that we led during the pandemic. Um, Bonnie Henry and I and others did a lot of listening. 
and we made changes based on that listing. So we're going to continue to do that. But I think as a community, we need to support the second hospital. We need to support long-term care, such as the one PICS is doing. We need to support primary care and mental health and addiction care and renal care, not all of which is about hospital campuses, but about improving services for people. And that's what we've got to continue to do. But thank you for what you're doing at Surrey. The Memorial Emergency, you know, um, the, the, the numbers are historically high, but the, the numbers don't, I think, describe fully the situation. We're also seeing higher acuity. So if you look at our friends at BCEHS, they have about a 20% increase over three years on a population increase in BC of 5%, 20% of purple and red calls. That's what the emergency room is seeing as well. So it's not just the fact that there are more patients. It's the severity of those patients because some people, of course, you can spend 15 minutes with in discharge. Other people, if they have to go up to the wards, are in very different circumstances. And so sometimes when we see long wait times, it's for the former. But the level of care is so important and the higher level of acuity at Surrey Memorial and every other hospital is really felt. So thank you for all the work you're doing. Final question. Okay, thank you. I'm Ramona Captain. I'm the BC CARP uh, Chief Advocacy and Communications Officer. CARP is the Canadian Association of Retired Persons. So I'm very happy that you've been talking about our older adults um, as we get older and better. Um, the joke going around right now, and I, I don't mean to be frivolous, but it's um, if you want a doctor right away, call a cab because very likely the driver has uh, very good credentials in, in medicine. Uh, when are we going to fast track um, many of these professionals that we have coming from other provinces and other countries? Uh, many of my members don't have a regular uh, family doctor. There is an extreme shortage. We could have nurse practitioners. Uh, when I asked my um, pharmacy, my pharmacologist about certain things, he said, oh yes, the province has said that we will be able to prescribe certain things, but we really haven't received any kind of training. I don't know if he was telling me the truth or not, but this is the word on the street, and we really need to know more. Also, what about the um, building another tower or e another service at Surrey Memorial? I believe there is the space, there is the possibility of doing it. Is, a ma is it a matter of money? Is there no funding? So, um, that was uh, six questions. <laughs> um, and that's good. Um, on, fa on primary care. So, um, for what are called foreign trained doctors sometimes, the, some of the most significant changes have been made in the last 12 months to see more foreign trained doctors in BC. We already see the results of this in the results and the response to our uh, work with the doctors of BC. So those changes have been made, including increasing the number of spaces at UBC and building a new medical school. So here's what I would say to you about that issue, two things. One, we need to have quicker pathways to foreign trained doctors. That work's been done and right now by the college. For those foreign trained doctors who are not are not meeting the test of becoming a full doctor in BC. We created a, a status called associate physician. And there are not thousands, but there are 340 or so people in BC who would be eligible for that. So that's an opportunity to use them and their skills now as they build up to that. That's an important change. On nurse practitioners, um, a predecessor of mine, George Abbott, allowed nurse practitioners uh, to start to be used in BC. The time I met, became Minister of Health, though we were last in the country in numbers of nurse practitioners per capita. There were about 250, there are about 900 now because we increased the training for nurse practitioners. So I'd say two things on, on it. One, we have an obligation to the world to train people here. We have an obligation to the world. We can't just see other people's training as a solution to our problem. So we have to increase the number of medical states. That's why UBC is adding 128. That's why we're adding the second medical school here. We do have to create better pathways for not just doctors, but as importantly for health sciences professionals, as importantly for nurses, as importantly for healthcare assistants to come and work here because they're all important on you know, primary care teams and many others. Right? So we have to do that. 
we have to reform the system too. We talked about pharmacies. We changed the, uh, the adaptation of medication by pharmacists. Uh, to date, about 130,000 adaptations have taken place in BC. That was a minor change made in October. Another one's coming on June 1st. And our pharmacists are basically doing the vast majority of immunizations now against the flu and, of course, against COVID-19. So we're expanding their scope of practice, allowing we've trained them. We've trained them exceptionally well, our community pharmacists. And if I can use this podium to say to community pharmacists in Surrey, uh, thank you very much. So those are all things we need to do. So we need to train more people. We need to make adaptations to the system so people can work to the full scope of practice. That's really important. We need to have easier pathways for internationally educated doctors and nurses and health professionals understanding that we have an obligation to deal with that situation ourselves by training people here in BC. And we've got to improve workplaces. So we've, we're adding, for example, 320 health authority employee HEU member security staff to our healthcare system. And it was something that came from the advocacy of nurses and healthcare workers and health sciences professionals and doctors to make it safer. Because you don't just need to train and add new people, you've got to retain people. And if they leave after three or four years, that's a huge effort made that is lost. So we have to do that. We have to support our workers who are working in emergency rooms and in cardiac and everywhere else. Because it's, there's, an, there's intensity out there, right? There is, and we have to support them. Um, and what about in terms what of the capital spending, this is the largest capital program we've ever seen. The Burnaby Hospital, the core of it, what we're replacing now, was built in 1954. The Dawson Creek Hospital, I think, is 1964. Mills Memorial Hospital in Terrace, the new hospital is going to open. That's, that was from 1959, right? And it goes on on. St. Paul's Hospital, which is a replacement project, which people messed around for 16 years about without doing in a dangerously unsafe building. We're building, right? This is uh, the largest capital plan. And on top of that, because you're involved with CARP, a $2 billion program for long-term care compared to $17 million in the previous 10 years. So we have to do all of these things. It's a major plan. Projects come forward and we address those needs. So this is an unprecedented degree of spending on health capital and on health human resources. And I understand that there will always be a need to do more. I understand that. But I think we should acknowledge what we're doing now. It's a massive uh, change and it's a positive change. And of course we have to do more here in Surrey and everywhere else. We're going to finish it there, everyone. I, I can, uh, I, I think I can, uh, everyone can agree. It takes great courage to be a politician, to respond to questions. And thank you so much. A round of applause. It's fun. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. And he'll he's going to stick around to speak to you one on one a little bit. So thank you so much, Minister. And thank you again to our presenting sponsor, Surrey Hospitals Foundation, our supporting sponsor, Simon Fraser University, our community sponsor, the Health and Technology District at the Lark Group. Tomorrow we are going to be back here at the same time with Canada's Minister of Natural Resources, BC's Minister of Energy Mines, and it's all focused on LNG, mining, and forestry, very important to our city. Everyone, make it a great business day. Thank you so much for attending.